So hi, I'm, I'm Noah Sussman. I'm a, uh, I'm a consultant in New York. I work for the most part with old media Fortune 500 companies helping to do all of the ugly logistical stuff that you have to do in order to get old media business models to function on the web. I've been doing that in one form or another since 1999. I've been involved with Selenium almost since the beginning, definitely since the Selenium core days. Uh, I uh, probably did some of the very first test automation with Cucumber and iOS. Uh, I, and most recently, I uh, helped uh, Etsy.com to design the, the CI system that supports their uh, high throughput continuous delivery process. So this talk is about, uh, mostly about what I learned uh, building that technology and that culture at Etsy, but also informed by the dozen plus uh, other shops that I've worked in in New York over the years. So um, this is the canonical Agile release cycle, or at least my, my conception of it. Um, you have sprints of a couple of weeks or a couple of months in length. Features get picked out at the beginning of the sprint. They're built during the sprint. And at the end of the sprint, features are handed off to QA to test and validate in a special environment. And at the point where, uh, where the tests are valid, I mean, where the release is validated and all the tests are passing, and then only at that point do we deploy the new feature to production. So continuous delivery, which is a topic of increasing interest uh, in the industry and is certainly enabled by uh, the CI and Selenium technology that everybody is talking about uh, this week. Uh, continuous delivery obviously is a very different mindset. Um, releases, are, releases happen continuously. At, uh, at Facebook, as I understand it, they happen once a week or more. At Etsy, the Deployments happen multiple times a day, sometimes up to uh, the, the max when I was there was 96 deployments in one day. So the typical deployment velocity for a continuous delivery shop is a deployment once a day to, uh, to multiple times an hour. Um, this is obviously really different from uh, Agile in lots of interesting ways, but the way that is of interest to everybody here, I think, is um, when you're deploying once an hour, there is obviously no time to do the, the canonical QA task of validating the entire product to make sure that everything still works. Uh, you simply cannot do a week of QA in, in the 40 minutes that, that exist between a releases and a continuous delivery environment. So there are a lot of tools, both cultural and software, that have been developed to mitigate this. These include uh, config flags, production monitoring. Um, I, I won't go into the gory technical details of, of any of that today, but I think that the, the really important key difference is that because code is deployed dark, uh, meaning that new code is behind a config flag, meaning that it, it is it cannot execute in production. It's inside a branch of an, of an if else block that's tied to a Boolean value in a config file somewhere, and that Boolean value is false. Uh, and then at some point in the future, when the feature is considered complete, that feature flag will be flipped, and all of those pieces of the feature that have been deployed piecemeal over time will suddenly start executing in production, and the feature is on. Um, that that mechanic of config flags and, a, and constant A-B testing is what enables continuous delivery to issue the, the long, arduous QA process between every release. It's also quite chaotic. Um, Chad Dickerson characterized it as an airport without an air traffic controller. Uh, just all of these developers lining up in an IRC channel with their little micro changes wired off behind config flags. And one after another, they deploy to production without asking for permission, without, um, 
without any, you know, without any rigorous testing from a, from a siloed separate QA team. And when they're done, they perform a couple manual tests, they look at some graphs, and then the next person goes up. And you do that all day, every day. So while, while an airport without an air traffic controller is a, is a grandiose and intentionally sort of scary metaphor, this flat, emergent, evolutionary approach to deployment actually makes a lot of sense when we look at the observed behavior of complex systems. Complex systems, as we all know, right? I mean, any website certainly qualifies as a complex system. Complex systems have emergent behavior, which is to say that it's not possible to look at the component parts of a system like a website and fully predict the behavior in production. Uh, it's also interesting to me that many improvements to websites are discovered in production rather than being designed by people sitting in a conference room with a whiteboard. And of course, systems have users, and users are very complex beings that want all kinds of things. Um, and the final uh, interesting characteristic of, of complex systems is that they're never actually finished. They're always evolving. This is true of buildings. This is true of websites. Uh, it's true of any sufficiently complex system. Expectations change, environments change, and changes are needed to the system. So in a continuous delivery environment, you can constantly make changes to the system. So now I've talked for a little over five minutes, and I haven't addressed the main topic of this talk at all. If you are a QA person, how many people in this room have, have quality in their title, by the way? Okay, so like a little less than half the room. How many people have a uh, test in their title? Interesting, so more, a lot more quality than test. Um, but okay, so about half the room has, has, is, is like a, has a quality or test role. So where does quality assurance fit in the continuous delivery cycle? And what is the utility of quality assurance when you can automate all of these wonderful checks that we, that we now can automate with Selenium and integration testing and unit testing and load testing and shell scripts that wrap curl and what, what is the manual tester, what's, what's left to do? In order to answer that question, I had to step back and look at what, to answer the question of what, what is QA supposed to do, we have to, we have to answer that in the abstract first, right? What, are, what is QA supposed to be accomplishing in general? Assurance is a weird word. I'm not a huge fan of the quality assurance phrase. Because what are, what are we supposed to be assuring? Are we supposed to be assuring that the system is completely safe, that the release is completely defect free? This is impossible. Complete testing is not something that we can accomplish given the technology that we have. Any, even, even a simple e-commerce website contains more execution paths than you could reasonably test in a century, even if you ran one test on one path per second. And then, of course, there's the, there's the factor that we're talking about a whole system, not simply the components we're testing. So this is a, this quote up on the screen now is from Dr. Sidney Decker, who is a really brilliant guy who spent a lot of time looking at safety and human error in complex systems in the life critical industries, aerospace, medicine, industries that, and I think this is an interesting point for those of you who like to research this stuff, the life critical software industries are willing to pay millions of dollars and spend multiple years doing real rigorous scientific studies on resilient code, resilient systems, safe software systems. We don't do that on the web, it's just not, it's just not a good return on investment. So if you want to know more about recent research into system safety, the life critical industries are a great place to start. But the point here is that I completely agree with Dr. Decker. It is not the case that websites are inherently bug free and that bugs are introduced by the actions of bad or careless actors in the form of software engineers or designers or the business who if not for these bad actors, we would continue to have these safe, cleanly operating performant websites. That's simply not true. 
Complex systems are not inherently safe. Safety is a property of both the system and the culture. And therefore, in, in a continuous delivery environment, but also in general, based on what we know now about system safety, it is simply the case that everyone needs to be responsible for quality all of the time. In, order, in, in dev, in design, in production, in customer support, in business development, because all of these people play in together to the, to the actual behavior and, the, and the, the abstract quality of the system. So in dissecting what QA is supposed to do, I found some interesting misconceptions that are very widespread and that if not checked can really hamper the development of, of CI and of automated tests in general. Um, as I said, it's not the case that there's a finite number of discoverable bugs. Um, there, there is in the abstract probably a finite number of discoverable bugs in any release, but we, we all know, right? I mean, you can, if you want to delay a release as a QA person, you totally can by just like continually nitpicking and rules lawyering and going back to requirements. That's not actually, um, that's not actually trivial. I mean, interpretation of requirements has a lot of bearing. There's another myth that at least like the worst errors, the really bad stuff, the stuff that takes the site down and makes, you know, threatens people's jobs, that those kinds of errors, because they're so bad, someone must be responsible. And therefore, since someone's responsible, if only we could find that responsible party or that responsible change before the release went out, then we would have prevented that catastrophe. And in the case of a catastrophe, it, it's, the, you know, it's, it's that we didn't, we didn't find the bug fast enough. This is not true. Another myth is that there's a specification somewhere, and the specification is passed down to development, development builds the system to the specification, and then QA can validate that the system meets the specification. Maybe at NASA where they take 10 years to develop one piece of software. But I defy you to find any commercial website that functions that way. At the very few clients I've had that actually had a spec, the spec was three years old, four years old, and reflected nothing about the production site. There's also a myth that at some point the release is done, done, right? It's, it's over, the feature is complete. We all know this is not the case. Users want things, bit rot happens. But I think the most informative myth when it comes to figuring out how QA can help with continuous delivery is the myth that when bugs happen, it's, it's these really like complex like, things that even you know developers are really smart and the complexity is just so much that even really smart developers can't, can't catch the bugs and we need, you know, QA is a safety net, right? Just full-time dedicated to catching these worst possible things that sneak through. But actually, most, I mean, anybody who had to support IE5 has a great story about a, a missing semicolon that snuck into production, right? And, and in fact, looking at, um, looking at some of the, um, the big outages that have happened recently, uh, the cascading failures, GitHub dropping their production database, these things all come down to agglomerations of small errors, which often seem like a missing semicolon in, in JavaScript. These small errors that, that really seem trivial and are trivial taken on their own. There's a theory of risk called the Swiss cheese principle, where Swiss cheese, because Swiss cheese has holes, right? If you take a bunch, if you, so just run, run with this for a minute. It's, it's, Let's think of each layer of cheese as a layer of defense in your system, a layer of protection, cultural, technical, whatever. And we, for any threat to get through and cause an outage, it has to get through all those layers of the cheese. Now, if you, rotate, if you, you, know, if you have a stack of sliced Swiss cheese and you rotate the slices enough, eventually it's probably you could get slices to line up so that there's a hole all the way through. And the more holes in the cheese, the more likely it is that you could get the holes to line up. And when in this metaphor, when all the holes line up, then, a, then an outage is able to punch through your defenses and get to production. 
So this is a great argument for developer testing, unit testing, static analysis, code standards. These things are really important. Um, these are things that, that a QA team can't really help with. These are things that, these are the types of errors that developers need to manage uh, and designers. The people who are closest to the code are the best at eliminating all of the small trivial errors that creep into code. And again, the more, the more of those trivial errors that are eliminated, the fewer holes there are in the, in the metaphorical cheese and the harder it is for risk to slip through. There's also a consideration that the cleaner code is, the easier it is to comprehend, and the more comprehensible a system is, the easier it is to predict its behavior. And the more predictable the behavior of a system, the safer we all are. This is the key to me to understanding what's wrong with the traditional quality assurance approach. Quality assurance, right, the, before computers, quality assurance meant people with white coats in a clean room, say in an automobile factory, you know, with gloves on, testing individual components of the automobile. Um, this just doesn't make sense with a system as complex as software. It's not the case, as we all know, that you can test every component of, the, of, of a website and then walk away and say, well, there won't be any bugs in production. Every, every unit test, every, every tester has a great story about the time all the tests passed, but the site went down, right? Or the time that you know, we tested everything except the thing that actually broke, right? That's, that's a very common story. These are, again, not, not these are not faults. These are not trivialities. These are fundamental properties of complex systems that we are slowly learning to address. So this, this is a, I'll actually read this slide. The best software engineering principles, quality assurance, and the highest standards are not going to be enough. They are required, right? I'm not saying don't test, right? I'm not saying don't do QA, I'm just saying Component testing isn't enough. It is not sufficient. So here are Dr. Levison's three additional practices for system safety. And I think these have a lot of bearing on where QA is going. So the first is oversight. And I think this is absolutely every single time I give one of these talks, except maybe this time, because I'm just, I finally incorporated into the talk, I get the question, how do I sell this to my boss? How do I get my boss to give me the time to do, you know, do selenium testing or you know, build CI? Or, and my answer always is you, you, you can't. Probably, I mean, maybe you can, but most likely you, you can't do it. Your boss needs to be on board for, for selenium to be adopted. I personally do not know of a case where an organization has uh, reimagined their workflow and gotten testing in place without at least a director level manager being intimately involved in the whole process. And I'm talking about an engineering manager, not a, not a director of product, like an engineering director. I think without, without that kind of oversight and policy, it, it can't happen. Limiting complexity is a huge theme in all of these papers and research from the life critical industries. Uh, anybody who's read about the Challenger disaster knows that the, just the, the complexity of communication and the many layers at NASA contributed to, again, the o overlooking what turned out to be a fairly trivial error. I mean, rubber cracks when it gets cold. How hard is that? Yet we lost a space shuttle. And the final thing that Dr. Levison advocates is promoting systems thinking in the organization. And I think that continuous delivery does a great job of this because it flattens everything out and gives developers and designers responsibility for their code in production and thus causes everyone to start thinking about the whole system. Right, so what was I talking about? Where does QA fit in the process? Right. Um, there's this great concept that James Bach came up with called exploratory testing, sometimes called expert testing. In the, in the tester community, you'll hear expert testing and exploratory testing contrasted to automated checking, which is what they call everything that we do. Now, I think that that's actually a fair comparison because we all know that ultimately some computers are kind of dumb about some stuff that's really obvious to the rest of us. 
everybody, I'm sure, has had a case where a selenium test passed, but it turned out that all of the elements were hidden. So a user couldn't use the site, right? Computers are a little dumb. Human intelligence and human critical thinking are required elements for understanding the safety of a system. So exploratory testing focuses on user experience, on user goals, right? Are we delivering customer satisfaction? Are we making money? Are, are, are our competitors winning because our software is slow or hard to understand? And expert testing is equally useful in production, in dev, during the design phase. The interesting thing about this approach is that you, you've ideally right, automated away all of the repetitive manual crap that makes QA people burn out and go insane. That is one of the wonderful things about Selenium to me is that it gets rid of the need for constant repetitive stress inducing clicking through the same stuff. But it is a fact that once you have automated away all of the repeatable things, you're left with a residue of risks that are not automatable. And those are, by definition, those are some of your worst risks. So QA can really help here. And there's also, I think, an important factor that developer testing, for the most part, tends to be very positive in nature. Even the best developers will say about their testing, I make an assumption and then I validate my assumption. There's something Rasmus Lerdorf, the creator of PHP, said to me about how he works, and I thought it was brilliant. And I think Rasmus is a brilliant guy. Um, and I think that the best developers work that way. They make an assumption, and then they validate that it's true. Don't just, you don't just say, like, well, this, this algorithm is more performant because it got the most votes on, on uh, Stack Overflow. You benchmark. That's great. But there's still a need to invalidate assumptions, to look at everything else that's the residue that's left over after all of the developer assumptions have been validated. And this is what, this is what QA did, wound up doing at Etsy, and I think this is QA's new role. So Ed Keyes said at GTAC in 2007 that sufficiently advanced production monitoring is indistinguishable from testing. He posed the question, if you break the site but you catch it so fast that no user notices, and you fix it, what is the functional difference between that and catching the error in dev? So here's an example of how production monitoring, which certainly at Etsy included Selenium tests, because I think Selenium tests are a wonderful production monitoring tool, it also included Nagios, which you guys should know is very, very similar in spirit to Selenium, and also can be integrated with Selenium. I think that in general, if you look at the production monitoring tools used by system operations, you will be surprised to know once you get past the surface how much these tools have in common with functional test tools. And the ops people will be surprised as well. And it, for me, at least, that's, that's been a source of some great con conversations and some great friendships. Anyway, at Etsy in 2012, we realized that we had about a quarter million real-time metrics. That's way too many to fit on a dashboard, right? It's way too many for analysis. Machine learning algorithms aren't up to it. So what we wound up doing is picking the graphs we thought were the most important and throwing them up on a dashboard where everybody could see them. Like, everybody. Everybody in the office. People walking through to visit, customer support, the CEO, everybody. And here's an example of catching an error in production. Now, I'm not going to say what service this is, but it's a mission-critical service. And it actually happened that an executive was in the office early in the morning and looked over at the dashboard and went, that graph looks funny. And this is the wonderful thing about this production monitoring as manual testing approach, is that you don't need to have a whole lot of technical acuity to understand that like, that graph had a major change. And if you know what service that is, you would know that's an emergency. Now, the horizontal axis on this graph is time, and it's in 10-minute increments, and so the, the length of that outage is 20 minutes, because, exactly because we saw it on a graph, and then we called the smart engineers who actually know what that graph means and how to fix it, and 20 minutes later, it was fixed. 
This is an example. These two graphs are correlated. The bottom graph is busy Apache workers in production. And the top graph is a, is a behind the firewall service that does not touch production at all. But it happens that at this time, at least, the dev environment and the prod environment use the same network switch. And that top graph is network traffic. And every time the network traffic on that internal service spiked, it clogged the tubes, so to speak. And the, site, the production site went down for one second. And this was happening like 30 times a day. So these, these one second micro outages, and we're going crazy. And eventually we found this graph and correlated the systems and, and we fixed the problem. And by eventually, I mean eight hours. Now, anybody who's had to debug that, that kind of really messy, weird, like how can that even happen, that can't happen type of issue, knows that without good feedback, that, that could take days, weeks, right? We, some, some organizations might just decide to live with micro outages because like no, the customers don't know. It can happen, I mean, cost benefit, right? But because of all of these graphs and all of this feedback, it was possible to, to figure it out. So this is one dashboard at Etsy. And you can see it's kind of overwhelming. Um, you can't really watch all of those at once. I mean, you know, for you sitting in the audience, like which one's, which one's anomalous? Are any of them anomalous? Anomaly detection is really tricky stuff. It is not something that machine learning is up to yet, and I think that some of it involves undecidable problems that machine learning will never be able to handle. Certainly the halting problem has a lot of bearing on anomaly detection. So here's something from the open source community that we in the open source community have known for a long time, but we in the enterprise haven't really internalized yet, which is that if you have technical bug reports and bug reporters who have insight into the technology, things get fixed a lot faster. And this was a key insight for me at Etsy because I, my first hire was a QA analyst who I intended to train to do Selenium. And she had a little bit of experience scripting QTP, but she was mainly you know, seven years in like financial services, manual testing, big QA environments. And what she had learned to do was what every developer does, keep an eye on the Git log and see what's changing. And when you see a test fail, correlate it with a file, with a, with a code change, and then bring it to the developer. This was an amazing innovation to have a QA person who was, who was you know, essentially a manual QA person, but was really keyed into the code. And this became a goal for me for how QA is supposed to work. Now, regardless of the, leaving aside the question of does QA need to code, which I think is a, is a whole other talk, and like I said, I mean, there, there is always room for human, intervent human critical thinking, no matter how much automation there's doing. So there's room for QA people who don't code. But QA people need to come closer to the technology, closer to the metal, so to speak. So that's, that's basically what I learned building a, a QA team in a continuous delivery environment. In conclusion, I'd say that overall, in, it sounds like it's great to hear everyone's running CI this year. It sounds like a lot of people are running CI. Pay close attention to the places where you are making trade-offs. I, I believe that risk is kind of like energy in the law of thermodynamics. Risk can be neither created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed. Continuous delivery transforms the nature of risk. Instead of saving all of the risk up for a QA phase at the end of the sprint, risk is amortized over many, many deployments and many people performing all kinds of exploratory tests throughout the system every day. But there's no less risk. And so in making these transitions, it's extremely important to keep in mind what trade-offs are being made. And finally, I would say that the the fact that it's more fluid when you're running builds all the time and the feedback is faster and the hierarchy is not as, is not as much in play. People are just sort of reacting to builds and talking to each other and walking around. Embrace that. Websites aren't really built to specifications anyway. Build production monitoring systems 
And again, use Selenium to do it. Selenium is fantastic for exploring complex flows and logging all kinds of interesting stuff and screenshotting and making videos that even an executive can understand. Build that stuff in production. Teach people to watch it. Test the whole system. Test in production. Test in dev. Don't consider, don't componentize the system. Test the whole, test the whole thing. And take what you've learned and incrementally, in small steps, improve your product. And you'll give your customers what they want. I think I have like three minutes for questions, but I will be around for the rest of the day. Uh, and I love to talk about these issues. If you're in New York, please ping me on Twitter. I would be happy to have lunch. Like, shoot me email. I, I'm. All, this is all I do. I love to talk about this stuff. Anyway, so questions? So the question is, um, as I predicted, the question is, how do you get, so you need, a, you need upper management behind you. How do you make that happen? Actually, I think that that question has gotten easier to answer in recent years because what's changed is that a lot more organizations are talking about how they do this now. So you can point to Facebook. You can point to, that keynote yesterday was fantastic. That was, that was like the most dirt about the Google test system I've ever seen dished in one talk. So, I mean, show your, by all means, go back and show your boss the video of that keynote. I mean, that 15,000 people committing to one trunk, I think that's the most, I think that, thank you all, I think that's the most anyone has ever retweeted anything I've ever put up. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Um, if you look at any of the Amazon talks from Velocity, the O'Reilly Velocity Conference, you'll, you'll find a lot in there. Um, John Rouser is one, of the, is one engineer. You'll find a lot in there about how Amazon does continuous delivery. And I don't have time to get into it, but it's crazy what you can do when you don't have to pay for EC2. They're very aggressive. You know, thousands of deployments a day. Literally, thousands. Um, Etsy, while they are not on the, while, while they're certainly not Facebook, Etsy has done a really good job of documenting everything that they've done in their engineering blog. Um, that's a that's a great source of um, that's a great source of information, and I'd also say that that Chad Dickerson at Etsy is a very gregarious, outgoing CEO, um, and it's it's completely possible that your management will bump into him at some point, and he's one of the most avid continuous deployment advocates that I've ever met. Um, so I think that I think the answer is basically like point to all of the really big successful companies that are doing this and have been doing this for a long time and try to get your upper management into, into situations where they're interacting with the upper management from these organizations. Because I think if, you know, I think any, man, any CEO who sits down with somebody like Chad and really and hears about how much money's been saved by adopting these kind of, of processes and hears it from another, you know, from another leader, not from somebody on the floor. I, I think that, that that probably can be pretty convincing. Um, and I'll just also say, I mean, the other, the other thing is that, you know, you can always vote with your feet as an engineer, you know, and going to another company and building something really cool that, that works and lets people go fast and be safe and blogging about it is a great way to, is also a great way if you can't affect change at your company to change the overall culture of engineering. You know, I mean, that's what has to happen. That's why these waterfall processes are still in place, because that's the received wisdom. That's how you do it. As we move forward and the received wisdom changes, then, then they'll do it a different way. And then there'll be somebody else standing on this stage 10 years from now going like, God, continuous delivery, man. It's like so ancient. But that'll be a good day. Um, all right, well, I think I'm out of time, but feel free to catch up with me or, uh, or find me on Twitter. Thanks a lot.